today, our farm to school focus is on educational activities you can do during and leading up to winter time. Some of these activities are specific to gardening and some require nothing other than being in an outdoor space. As we've said before, but can't emphasize enough, anyone who finds themselves in the role of educator this year can engage in this kind of very important non-screen time sensory-based learning. So it turns out that there is so much you can do and appreciate in outdoor spaces and gardens in the winter with students that once again, we have a very full agenda today. We will talk about when the season changes to winter, what happens in the sky, what happens with the weather, what happens in the garden and on the farm, how do people change and respond, and what can we learn about trees and animals. So let's get started. Uh, my name is Kimberly Kugler. I'm the Farm to School Coordinator at Georgia Organics. And I will let Jenna and our special farmer guest speaker, Raul, introduce themselves next. Hi, I'm Jenna Mobley, and I'm an educator here in Atlanta Public Schools. I've been a public school teacher for about a decade now. And I'm so excited to share some of these winter lesson ideas with you. And I am thrilled to have Raul here with us too, one of my favorite farmer friends. So I'll let him introduce himself. Hey, my name's Rahul Anand and I run Snapfinger Farm just outside of Atlanta. Uh, we grow fruits, vegetables, and have all kinds of value added products as well. Great. We are so glad you're here. All right, so now let's take a listen to who else is in the room here with us, our virtual space. Um, we'd love to launch a poll and hear what sort of outdoor space you might find yourself teaching in over these next couple of months. Whether you're a parent or a teacher or a pod leader, um, we'd love to know if you will be teaching in um, a schoolyard or a school garden. Either you have a garden there at school or just like the playground, the schoolyard. If you'll be teaching like in your home yard, in a neighborhood park or in a garden, um, what sort of space might you find yourself teaching in? You'll see that poll pop up. And when you do, please select the answer that fits closest to where you may find yourself teaching. Well, we have lots of school gardens. That's great. A couple of school teachers without gardens. Some home yards, some home gardens. Great. So I'm so glad to hear that so many of you are at school and have access to either school gardens or community gardens. And in our presentation today, we are going to mention a lot of different lesson plans and themes and ideas that can be explored, whether or not you're teaching at home or at school, and whether or not you're teaching in a garden space with crops and vegetables growing, or just in the outdoors, in a park or in a schoolyard. We'll cover all of those ideas. And if you have any questions as we move along through the different lesson ideas about how this would apply to your setting, please jump into that chat box and ask us. And we'll be happy to figure out with you, all of us together, how these might work for the setting that you're in this year. Okay, so really quick, what is Farm to School? Farm to School in a nutshell is basically buying locally grown foods or growing food yourself to both feed and teach cooking and tasting locally grown foods and learning about and through locally grown foods and food producers. We want to emphasize today that farm to school doesn't have to drop off during the winter. We tend to think that the farming season is over come winter, but every season is important in the cycle of how food is produced. There is real educational value in connecting to seasonal changes and completing the circle, looking at the full cycle. Plus, we live in Georgia, where it is actually possible for us to grow food year round. <clears throat> so you can even in winter still get locally grown foods by purchasing them from a farmer in your community, like Raul, or by growing them yourself. And there is still a lot to learn about the cycle of food production in relation to changing seasons. 
So to reiterate, we think that the best farm to school programs include learning about and through local foods and how they're grown, eating local foods and engaging with your community around local foods. Hands-on activities like cooking, taste testing and gardening engage students in different learning modalities and are fun ways for students to learn the education standards they need to learn, as well as learn about the impact of their food choices on their health, their community, and the local economy. And just like Kimberly said, there are so many reasons why we as teachers, as parents, as pod leaders would choose to teach through this context of food. Like Kimberly mentioned, this is a way to teach the academic content and the academic standards in a way that is engaging and sensory and hands-on for all of our children. It's also a way to encourage our children to connect with their food that leads to healthier habits. It's a way to get kids outside breathing fresh air and moving their bodies. And it's a way to teach kids life skills around being outside and growing food and cooking and preparing food as well. Now today we're focusing specifically on the changing of seasons, the changing of seasons that we are experiencing right now. And if you've been in some of our webinars before, you know that many of these webinars and almost all of my lessons with children start with a quiet moment for a mindful observation. And so typically with my kids, we're outside in a big circle spread out and they root their toes into the ground and they fold their fingers and they can close their eyes and take a couple deep breaths and just listen to the world around them, then open up their eyes and pivot so they can see the world around them. And in this silent mindful observation time, I usually ask some leading questions. Now, if you've been here before, oftentimes the leading question is as simple as, what is the same as the last time you were here the week before? And what is different from the last time you were here the week before? But particularly when we're getting closer to the changing of seasons, we can ask even more specific questions so that kids can hone in on what exactly is shifting in their environment. So what is happening in the sky and with the weather? What does that mean? What's happening with the people? Are we dressing differently? Are we doing different things out here? What do you notice in the garden? Has something changed in the garden? Or when you went to the farmer's market this past week and what changed there? What is looking different and feeling different? Do you notice any changes in the trees? Do you notice anything different with the animals or the animals that you're seeing? And so if we were all outside, this is something we would do together. Since we're not, let's jump into that chat box and share with us, what have you noticed that has changed in the world around you recently? What have you noticed as you just moved through the world? And how is it a little different from the weeks prior? And you can use any of these prompts. Yeah, it's colder. That's definitely the first thing I noticed too, because I always forget to bring a jacket these days. Yeah, and at the market, there's lots of orange veggies, there's carrots and there's sweet potatoes. Yeah, the yard is covered in leaves. I know that too, because I feel like I now need to go get my rake out. Chilly air, less pollinators, we get to wear sweaters. Oh, Liz mentioned that there's not as many colors. We're getting more monochrome. Oh, the ginkgos, I love that, Dawn. Yes, it's definitely getting dark so early. I've definitely noticed that the chickens are going to bed earlier. The pepper and the tomato plants died off in the frost. Ooh, more crows, boots and tights. I'm right there with you, Veronica. Great, there is so much to love about this season and so much to notice that's changing in this season. So oftentimes after a mindful observation, I like to also read a seasonal poem. You've gotten this in some of the last webinars too. And I chose one that's coming up here for December 11th this time so that you can use this in the coming weeks with your children if you want to. And again, as Kimberly reads this poem, think about what is mentioned in here. Is it mentioning what's changing in the trees or in the weather or the animals? What observations can you make from this poem about how the seasons are changing as well? KK, take it away. All right. And when the orange is gone, and the red is gone, and the pink and the yellow are gone and gone. The green that stays is not just green. The green that stays is cold and alone, in a forest, slightly bored, but not sad or worried, just waiting. Thank you, Kimberly. Again, I love starting with poetry because poetry reminds us that this is all about asking questions. 
Poetry is about asking questions and engaging with the outdoors is about asking questions way more than it is even finding the right answers. It's about exploring together. So when we read a poem like this, we can ask our students, what, what are they talking about? When we say the orange is gone, the red is gone, the pink, the yellow, they're gone. What, where were those colors and where did they go? And what do you think the poet means when they say that the green is alone or it's bored? What do you think that might mean? There's no right answer, but we're getting into that sense of asking questions, just like we will about our environment. So let's start asking some questions about our environment. And I'm starting with the sky and weather here because one of the first things that we all notice is how the temperature is changing. So with my kids, oftentimes we keep a line graph to chart the temperature either each day at the same time when we go out at recess or the minimum and maximum each day. You can see here there's a thermometer and this is a minimum and maximum for thermometer that I got off, um, I think Ace Hardware for like $13. But it's really interesting because it will chart both the coldest that it's been since the last time you press the button to reset it and the hottest that it's been since then. And so my kids keep a double line graph to chart those changes. Now, if you don't keep that line graph with your kids, you can also find this online. So I chose one for Atlanta, that is sort of central here, but these are available for all different places all over the state. And this shows what that temperature is for every day throughout this year so far. And so with our kids, we can read this chart and say, how is the temperature changing? How, which direction is it going in? We know that sometimes it goes higher, sometimes it goes lower, but generally, which direction is it going in? And we can see together that it is dropping. Now, why the temperature is dropping comes back to that first grade standard of how the celestial bodies move through the sky and specifically that tilt of the earth. So you can see in the diagram here that the reason the temperature is dropping is that our northern hemisphere is tilted away from the sun. So we're getting a little less sun each day and the angle is not as direct on us. That is why that temperature is dropping. And that's why soon we'll drop as low as our first frost. So you can see on the chart here, there was a, a blue line here. I made it a little bolder so you could see. And this is right here at 32 degrees. And this is a big deal in our garden. And we'll talk about why in a second. But first, in the chat box, I'd like to see if you guys can make a prediction. This is what we love doing with our kids is we love doing guessing games. We love all games, really. Um, but guessing games, on when do you think that first frost is going to come? Now, again, we we're talking about Atlanta specifically um, just because we had to pick one place and because that's the chart that we're looking at. And we've gotten really close here to the first frost so far, but we haven't gotten there yet. Make your prediction here in the chat box. What date do you think Atlanta will reach the first frost based on this chart? Diana thinks November 30th. November 25th, a little earlier for Lori. Yeah, we got really close to it here, maybe on like November 2nd or 3rd, but now we're all the way up here. Yeah, in real time, not till December 1st or 6th, November 26th. Oh, so many great guesses. Yeah, so we'll have to check back maybe on our next webinar and uh, see who gets it right here for Atlanta. Now I want to show you another resource here is you can go to the Far Farmer's Almanac and they have collected some data to make predictions on when the first frost will be for all different parts of our state. So then this again is the frost date for Atlanta. And if you see here, I circled it. They thought that our first frost date was going to be November 13th. Well, we have passed November 13th. Atlanta has still not quite gotten a frost, although we've been very, very close. You can also see here that that is with 30% probability. So that's another math lesson with the kids is to see what the chances are of them being correct and how far off each of those were correct and who got the closest. So a couple of other quick impacts of this tilt of the sun and activities you can do with your kids is this is also the reason why the days are getting shorter. So along with tracking that temperature and the changes and when we get close to that frost, we can also track the length of the days, the sunrise and the sunset times. 
Now I will say that I'm not typically with my kids when the sun rises and when the sun sets. So this is typically, typically an activity where I have my kids look up the sunrise and sunset times on weather.com and then create the chart with that real time data to show the length of the days. And again, that is that tilt of the earth and having that angle of the sun that makes the days shorter. This tilt of the earth and the angle of the sun also makes our shadows longer. So here's another activity you can explore with measuring shadows. That's another first grade standard of light and shadows to see how that impact um, occurs during these winter times. Now let's see what that looks like in the garden and on the farm. What does all of this mean? Our temperatures are dropping, we're getting close to the frost, we have a little less sun and the angle is a little deeper. What does that mean for all of our plants growing? Well, first of all, we're growing mostly, like what are we gonna see in the garden? We'll probably still have some roots, like our turnips maybe from turn up the volume month. We may also have our hardy leafy greens. And there's a lot of other things that those are really good in the school garden, but there are all sorts of other things that farmers can grow in their garden that you might see at the farmer's market. So let's ask Raul, what is growing on your farm this winter, Raul? Yeah, so we've got some of the things that, well, let me see, let me just turn this camera around. So, so here are those hardy greens that you were talking about. We've got our kales. And then we've got some spinach going in over here. Um, some things like garlic go in and start growing now, but aren't ready for harvest until the spring. But all of your coal crops, your cabbages, I don't know how if you can really see from this distance, but cabbages, kohlrabi, broccoli, cauliflower, all those are growing. Um, sunchokes, fennel, um, and especially if you have these tunnels, you can you can grow a lot of things that normally wouldn't grow in the winter in Georgia because it's so mild. Great, Raul, what's your puppy's name? Very important question. That is, uh, that's Lincoln. Oh. And, and Baloo is not here, <laughs> somewhere else. I want to look at your long shadow, just like we were just talking about. That's right. Very long shadow this time of year. Thanks so much, Roy. Well, we'll have you back in just a minute. All right. All right. So there's lots growing still in Georgia. And like Kimberly mentioned earlier, we have a great long season where we can grow all sorts of things in Georgia, in school gardens and on farms and having those available at our farmer's market. But this frost really does impact these plants and what can be grown. So here you can see these tomato plants, what happened when the frost hit. Now this is a great fifth grade lesson to get a little deeper into what frost actually means. What happens, you can see here in the picture on the left, what happens is that this water gets between the cells, the plant cells, and that causes those cells to get a lot smaller. Then that pressure and the stress might make those cell walls break, which is what you can see here on these leaves. This wilting of the leaves is what happens when those plant cell walls rupture from this ice that's inside. Also, if there's ice for a long time, the soil can become icy and make it hard for plants to get all the water that they need. But of course, our hardy plants are tougher evergreens. Those are all built for, they're all ready for these colder weather. And that's how we can still keep our kale growing and why we still see our pine trees still growing during the winter. So from Raul, what does it mean for you when you know that the frost is going to come? Are you also tracking it like we are? Have you had yours yet? Yeah, definitely tracking it. I think your farmer's almanac would have put me at somewhere around November 7th. Uh, we have not yet had that frost. We still do have peppers that are alive. Um, yeah, it's that, that, the frost date is very important for us. So all of our things like our field cut flowers, um, that's a pretty much kill temperature for them. The tomatoes and peppers and veal, um, and uh, it's generally time to start protecting some of our more sensitive field greens. So like fennel will survive, but to sell a fennel bulb, it needs to not be mush. And that's what it'll be after that point. Um, and so it's, it's just a marker um, to start winterizing the farm, making sure 
water pipes aren't freezing that are out in the open and we're, we're swapping our crop plans. But, and in addition to that, another date that we look at is the last 10 hour sunlight day, which uh, comes, er, I think December 7th, 10th, early, maybe around the first week of December. So for that, you saw we have all these crops and tunnels um, and that obviously helps them through the winter. But when the day length drops below 10 hours, even if it is uh, controlled for temperature, the rate of growth declines significantly and things grow a lot slower. So if, if we want successions of things like lettuce going through the winter, we want to start doubling up leading up to that date because growth will slow significantly at that point. That's really interesting. I didn't even think about that. So that's another reason why it might be interesting to track that sunset and sun, wait, sunrise and sunset times each day is to see how many hours your plants are gonna have to grow. That's way cool. Thanks Raul. All right, and that's a perfect segue into our next question here is, is like Raul said, um, we have limited sun. So how is it that we can harness this sun for our plants, get the very most out of the sunlight that we have? Um, and of course, if you are an early care teacher, you probably could guess that my favorite song when we do this unit is the, uh, oh, Mr. Sun, Sun, Mr. Golden Sun. We won't make you sing it today, but that's a great one for this unit. Um, and this is one of my favorite books for the unit about the importance of the sun. And, and I'm showing a picture here of one of uh, my favorite pages that shows specifically what the sun can do for plants. It says, I go down to breakfast. My cereal is made of wheat. My dad tells me that the sun made the wheat grow. He says the sun gives power and energy to make plants and trees grow big and tall. And since we know that's true, especially during these winter months, we need to think about how we can keep and collect and harness as much of that sun as we can for our plants. So one thing that we can do is we can create these mini greenhouses. We usually do these out of these milk jugs or water jugs, these gallon sized jugs now with my kids, but two liters work as well. And this is an opportunity for the kids to put a thermometer inside of the jug and outside the jug. And when they keep it closed, they can track those temperatures inside and outside to see how they are different. Because what's happening is that light energy is coming into the jug and the thermal energy is getting trapped inside. So it'll be nice and warm inside of there when the lids are on so that all of these little leafy greens can grow up through the winter. Now you can see them here that they're open. In the middle of the day, we often open them up so they can get a lot of fresh air and enjoy some of that sunlight, but we do close them up during the nighttime when it gets sort of cool. And we actually, there's a picture somewhere that I need to find of these covered in snow. The one year we got that crazy snow up here in Atlanta. Um, and even then we opened them up and all the little plant babies were just fine there inside. And then this is a project. We close them back up and do duct tape around them and send them home on the buses with the kids um, for winter break. So we grow these little grains for a little while in the classroom and then send them home so they can continue to grow them or harvest some microgreens there at home. Also in your garden, you can create a cold frame. Here's a couple of different examples of what those could look like using hay to go around your boxes or your in-ground beds and using recycled windows on top to again, let that light energy in and capture that thermal energy inside. Some of these are movable, like the ones you can see in the top right or the bottom right, and others we put around the beds like you can see here on the left. You can also create a grow tunnel or a hoop house. You can see here on the pictures on the right, this is how we have attached them to our raised beds, to the side of our raised beds, is we screwed in some brackets and this PVC pipe is very flexible to go all the way over the top. And we made these pipes over our beds year round because we use them to put shade cloth when it gets really hot. And then we put the blanket over it when it gets really cold. And sometimes if we have pests, that's when we put our chicken wire over or whatever it is to protect them. Um, these are really nice to have and versatile throughout the year. But then here on the left, you can see some other examples that are even simpler. Um, the top left is what we do most often is we just put the blanket over our plants. That's what the kids call it. It's just the blanket. And we do it every night. We put the bricks around um, so that they're all tucked in and they can stay nice and warm at night. Or they also sell these grow tunnels that are a little bit smaller just for the exact tunnels of the plants. Where it's same sort of concept though. It lets that light energy come in and the thermal energy get trapped inside there. 
So let's ask the farmer again. He just showed us a picture or the video of some of them. How do hoop houses and greenhouses help you out at the farm, Raul? So yeah, the hoop houses we can use to uh, extend our season to make sure we can have a, a, a wide variety of things year round. So in the winter, it allows us to increase yield on things like kale that could survive outside, but do much better with a little bit of protection. The greenhouse allows us to uh, both extend our season by getting a head start with transplants when it's still too cold to plant outside, but also just to, you know, do all of our own transplants. Um, so we grow almost everything from seed in the greenhouse and then transplant out to wherever it's gonna go. And, you know, like your tomatoes, for example, we can start in the greenhouse in mid January when we're still having plenty of frosts, um, but then have them ready to plant out early in the year. That's great rule. That's such a um, great idea too, is that oftentimes as a teacher, I'm doing these sort of shorter term, smaller projects to demonstrate how it's warmer in here and colder out here. Um, but you can actually time it just right, especially in the spring where you can get ahead of that frost date and start those plants and those seedlings in that greenhouse a little early with the intention of not just sending them home to the kids to deal with, but then having them ready to put in the garden the second it's safe for them to go outside in the garden. I love that idea. Raul, can we also ask you, Jennifer had a question about greenhouse covers. Um, mine is just sort of like a clear plastic that we use. Um, do you have a recommendation of what we can cover those hoop houses with, either the blankets that I unofficially call them or that clear plastic or where to find them? Yeah, so the, uh, the blankets, uh, for Georgia, you can use a pretty uh, low percentage Agrabon, uh, I think they call it woven row cover. Um, and you can find that, honestly, I'd probably just Google it and, um, and, and find it online. Um, but the greenhouse plastic, depending on your size, you could get away with any type of six mil or six mil plastic sheeting. Um, so even like a, a, a light transferable sheeting from the uh, from Home Depot that's meant for like painters, plastic or whatever can work. But if you want, you know, to just buy some any type of six millimeter or six millimeter um, plastic greenhouse covering can work. So you can get that from, you know, Johnny's Seeds or Nolts Produce Supply or really any. It's, it's a pretty widely available material. Great, thank you so much. And thank you, Lori, for putting some of those ideas in there too. And Kimberly Kugler, if you have any others, please let us know. At our school, we use exactly, exactly like Raul mentioned, just that um, plastic stuff from Home Depot. And we've used it year after year after year and we've had it forever and it works just fine for our purposes. Um, but we'll have some of those other ideas in the chat box as well. All right, so let's talk about what else is going on in the winter garden. In the winter garden, sometimes we can't even see, but one of the most important processes that's going on is decomposition. These are two of my favorite books about decomposition, A Log's Life, talking about what's going on, especially after these big storms that came through with all of these fallen trees and all of the animals that are inside there, eating them all up and decomposing them. And also around this time of the year, all of our Halloween pumpkins, our jack-o'-lanterns, as we watch those smoosh down to nothing on our porch, this is a book that's all about what's going on there. One of the easiest ways to explain decomposition to kids is with this decomposition jam song. So this is for my youngest kids. There are three different parts here and it just teaches the very basics of decomposition. So for this one, make sure you're on mute, but I would love to see your video so you can do the motions with me. This first group is going to show what the decomposers do. And what the decomposers do is they go munch, 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 munch. See if you can do that with me, if there's no one in your school laughing at you. Munch, 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 good. And then the big word that describes this process of all of the munching is called decomposition. So for this, we do what we call the decomposition disco. And it goes decomposition. Ooh, I should turn my screen off. I think that's probably more important for you to see these motions than to see the words. The words are pretty easy. Okay, so make sure that you are on the speaker view so you can see the decomposition disco. It goes 
decomposition, decomposition, decomposition. Yeah, I see some disco going on out there. Awesome. And then the last group, the third group says, oh, and this describes what decomposition actually means. That's a really big word and we get a lot of practice saying it in this song. What it means is that things are getting down and breaking down. So for this one, we go, I get down, I break down, I get down, I break down. Yeah. All right. So in this song, all three of those things happen at the same time, showing what the decomposers are doing. They're munching. And this is called decomposition, which means I get down, I break down. So we are going to do these motions with the actual song. I'll put this share screen back on so you can see. No, I won't. I think it's more important to see the motions here. And I want to see you guys too. I'm going to put you guys on gallery view. All right, here comes the song that we can do the motions with. Here's the munches. Yeah. Decomposition, 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 decomposition. Nice. I break down, I get down, I break down, I get down, I break down, I get down. Nice. Give yourselves a round of applause. That was so much fun to watch all of you guys doing that. <laughs> awesome, y'all. So that is one of the ways that you can teach the little ones what this big fancy word decomposition means. And then for your bigger ones, we can get into who exactly these decomposers are. And we call these decomposers the FBI. So for this song on mute, but I'd love for you to say it out loud, you're going to say the FBI, and then I'll fill in the gap. And then the FBI, and then I'll fill in the gap. And then at the end, we're going to do a call and response. So I'll call out fungus, and you'll yell fungus. I think you know how to do it. All right, so I'm going to leave the words up for this one so you can see them, and you can snap along with this one too, just like this. All right, here we go. The FBI, whenever something dies, the FBI is there on the scene. The FBI is working over time. The FBI to pick those bones clean. Fungus, fungus, bacteria, bacteria, invertebrates, invertebrates, the FBI. Nice. Give yourselves a round of applause on that one. All right, so these are all ways that we can learn some of this tough language around decomposition and fungus and bacteria and invertebrates and then we can put it into practice. So one of my um, favorite people in the whole world, Whitney, who works out at Life Lab in Santa Cruz, she always thinks it is so funny when people say that they compost. When people are like, oh yeah, I compost, I do that at home. And Whitney always says, she says, you don't compost. People, humans don't compost. What we do is we set up the ideal environment, the perfect setting, for a compost to happen, for decomposition to happen, for our decomposers to do all of that work. That's all we do. And as a teacher, I feel the same way. You know, like as a teacher, I don't actually like, the, I can't make the kids learn, but what we do is we set up this perfect environment where the kids can explore and learn on their own, right? Same thing with compost. So when we talk about how we can compost at our schools, we're talking about how we can create these ideal settings for compost. So here I have three examples of different things that I've tried at my school with varying levels of success. Um, and please in the chat box, share what works for you guys too. I know every school is so different on what works for composting. Um, the first thing that we tried, you can see here on the left, and this is like a compost tower. We just made it with um, chicken wire and we made a cake. And I'll show you what goes in the cake here on the next slide. But we made sort of layer after layer after layer the chicken wire helped because all the airflow could get inside and we could put a little bit of water in it. You can see there with the hose and that worked okay. Um, one year we got some yellow jackets that lived inside of it and that was not the best. That could happen anywhere with anything when you're working outside, um, but they were hard to get to when it was a tower like that too. Um, I also, my principal did not love the, um, the, what it looked like. So I had to work with my principal on that a little bit too. 
Um, so then we move to a three bin system um, that you can see here in the middle. So with this three bin system, you can have different stages of compost. And they're open there on the front where you can get in there with your shovels and you can turn that compost. And they're all still close to the ground. So you can put your um, compost thermometers in there and read the thermometer and see how hot it is getting in there with all of that action and move it over and over to the next bin. So you can see all the stages. And I loved that about it is that you can see all of those stages of the compost. Um, we also got some critters in that one after a little while. It's relatively clean, um, but again, you know, I'm a teacher and I got to keep my principal happy. So then what we ended up with next that was even closer to something that everyone could agree on is these tumblers that you see on the right side. We love these and we have since purchased, um, I think we have eight total of them. So again, we fill up one all the way before we move to the next one, before we move to the next one. So we can open up these doors and see the stages of the compost. I think that's really important. And that's something that I um, gathered from this three bin system that I really liked. Um, but what's great about these is they are completely contained. You close the door on them and then to turn them, instead of having my kids working with long handled shovels, which I no longer allow them to do for various reasons, um, but instead of having them use these long handled shovels to get in there and flip the compost or having a need for adult volunteers to do that turning of the compost, these tumblers are great because the kids, as you can see here in the picture, can just roll them on these wheels that are on their base. So the kids love this job. They feel like it's playground equipment, but they're constantly turning this compost, which is great. And we have had um, a lot of success with these. One of the funny stories right before I tell you what goes into this compost is that one of these composters had a plastic fork in it and another one had a Ziploc bag in it um, for a long time. And the kids were like, oh my gosh, that's not supposed to get in there. Why is there a plastic fork in there? But remember that we are not doing anything for production. It's all for education. And so we left that plastic fork in there because it was a really valuable lesson in that the fact that that plastic fork was always there. And there were some of my fourth graders that were just like, that plastic fork has been there since I've been in kindergarten, which was not true because we didn't even have those compost tumblers when they were in kindergarten. But they are getting the point, they're getting the idea that like everything else is breaking down, everything else is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and turning into this compost that we can sift and put in our garden, but this plastic fork is still there. And I think that's a really valuable lesson when you're doing compost um, activities like this one. So let's take a look now at what can go inside our compost systems. And the key is that we want to get a good balance of greens and browns. For our younger kids, that's the way we explain it, just greens and brown, like green leaves, like the wet, fresh leaves, and the brown leaves, the dried up leaves and twigs and wood chips and um, paper bags and that sort of thing. What our big kids know is that what those greens and browns are telling us is that the greens are full of nitrogen. They're very rich in nitrogen and that the browns are rich in carbon. So we have both wet and dry, green or brown, nitrogen, carbon, however you wanna describe it to your kids, but it's that combination that's going to let that compost happen. It's gonna make all of those decomposers very happy, give them a happy home to do all of their work there. Now I wanna take a moment to read part of my favorite book. It is Compost Sue here. And this is a really fun book to share um, all the different things that can go into Compost Sue. So make sure you're on speaker view here so you can take a look at the book Compost Sue. There we go. And it has a part that we're going to read together as well. I'm gonna skip a couple of parts so you can grab it for yourself. The paperback is now finally available if you wanna read the whole thing. But the part I'm gonna to skip to is the part with all of the different ingredients for the compost stew. Apple cores, bananas, brews, coffee grounds with filters used. Dirt clods crumbled, eggshells crushed, fruit pulp left behind all mush. Grass clippings, hair snippings, an insect or two. Okay, here's the part we're gonna do all together. It says just add it to the pot and let it all rot in the compost stew. Let's try it all together. Just add it to the pot and let it all rot for compost stew. Great. 
And then it keeps going with all of these different things. I can go into your compost too. And every couple of ingredients, it stops and it says, just add it to the pot and let it all rot for compost stew. And then for the rest of your teaching career, every time anyone ever puts anything in the compost, they're gonna say, add it to the pot and let it all rot for compost stew. Okay, then at the very end of the book, this tells us how we're going to make our compost stew. We have all the right ingredients and here's what's gonna happen next. Moisten, toss lightly, cover, let brew, and when the cooking is complete, Mother Earth will have a treat, dark and crumbly, rich and sweet. Now open the pot and what have you got? I bet you know, compost stew. So that is one of my favorite books to teach what all can go inside there and what happens inside that pot. I will give you um, one warning about this though, is that in my school compost, we decided to take only fruits and vegetables with no dressing on it. Um, and that was just to keep it as clean and simple as possible. Now, books like Compost Stew and charts, like this one that I showed you, show a lot of other things that can go inside here. And in commercial composting facilities, you can put all sorts of things. You can put your breads, you can put all sorts of things in there. Um, but you may want to think about at your site and depending on um, what structure you're using to not only what could go in the compost, but also what should go in the compost and making that sort of differentiation for your kids. Another way to help kids understand this compost idea is as always, is finding a way for them to make a mini sort of example of the compost. So this is a, a picture here of making a compost cake. Now this is not functional. This is just a way for an individual child or in a small group to combine those greens and browns, nitrogens and carbons, wets and dries in these sort of layers so that they will understand on a bigger scale what's happening by doing it on a smaller scale by themselves. We also can support decomposers, some of our favorites like worms. Um, we used to have, you can see here, this wooden worm bed um, that was multiple layers and that one worked really well, but now we just have this Rubbermaid container and it works just as well. The kids absolutely love the worms and love to add their um, scraps from their fruits and vegetables in there to watch them break down every single day and hold the worms and watch how they bur burrow away. They have a really great time with that too. So we can talk more offline if you're interested in knowing more about the worms. It's one of my favorite projects that we've had going for a long time. So let's ask the farmer again here. Um, Raul, will you tell us about the soil on your farm and um, how you use compost on your farm? Yeah, so our farm has, I guess, three distinct soil zones. Um, one is mostly just clay. And then we have a mixture of clay and Cecil loam, and then a section of sandy Cecil loam. Um, all three of those, you know, different challenges, different, you know, maybe the, the all clay is the worst. <laughs> but yeah, we, it, we do um, amend with compost on our farm. Um, we have a little bit of composting that we do here, but uh, like, kind of like you were saying about only you know, putting the things in that work for your operation. We only put vegetable scraps and wood chips in it. And our browns and greens are not the ideal composting ratio around whatever 70, 30 or whatever. You know, we, we, do, we do a lot more browns, um, which means that it decomposes much slower. Um, but it also means that we can have a sheet compost where we don't have to do a lot to it. Um, uh, that being said, we don't generate enough compost from that for our, our entire operation, so we do buy finished compost. Um, it's from South Georgia, and a lot of it um, is composted material from the waste of our number one, I think still number one product, cotton. Um, and so, you know, we'll get, we'll get some cotton scraps that we can see in there sometimes. But, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, oh, and speaking of the worms, we do use a lot of worm castings um, in our greenhouse mixes. So if we're seeding microgreens or different things like that, it's a really nutritious additive to the to the uh, you know our soilless coconut core or whatever mixes. So it's mostly sterile, nice airy material with a little bit of that super nutritious uh, you know worm poop added in. It's great for the plants. 
That's awesome. And uh, Raul makes a great point that you can also add compost to your garden without making the compost for your garden. There are lots of folks out there that are creating compost and that are very good at it. So that if you need that nutrients for your soil, you can just source it from somewhere else. And again, we do compost at our school as more of an educational experience for fun. And we still source it from somewhere else to actually support our, our garden. Um, I also want to mention in the chat box here, Jessica Roberts has made a bunch of worm bins. So definitely hit her up if you need some advice on that. Um, and Jennifer also mentioned that she, the pallets idea for the compost didn't work for her as well, but she seems to have some um, ideas about what could work with compost. So definitely jump into those chat and ask those two experts if you have any questions about that compost or worms. And before we let Raul go, I would like for all of us to read our poem to him. This is the poem that we typically do right before we taste any fruits or vegetables, and usually the farmer isn't right in front of us. We just send it off into the universe in hopes that the farmer can hear it. Um, I guess we'll have to stay on mute. All right, let's just make a copy. I think it's worth it. You can come off mute and we'll all read this together and thank Raul together and wave to him so he can see you. All right, are you guys ready? Everyone off mute and ready to tell Raul how great he is? Okay. As we As sit, we sit around, around this table, table under the painting, we are able all the farmers to eat. Thank you, Raul. Thank you, Raul. Thank you, Raul. All right, thanks. Yeah, so if you'd like to see Raul again, he is local here in Atlanta and close by, no matter where you are in Georgia. If you go to his website here, you can find all of his different farmer's market locations. You can order online to pick up at any of those locations. You can sign up for a weekly farm share. You can find his Instagram account so you can follow him there. Mm -hmm. He is a new friend. We'll be able to find him again. Thank you so much for thanking him with me here. All right, y'all, we only have a couple more minutes. So we are going to quickly go through a couple of other ideas here of things that you can study in the winter. So we can, of course, talk about what the people do in the winter. And we can talk about what our favorite traditions are with our family in the winter. Are there certain foods that we eat in the winter or around winter holidays? This book, The Shortest Day, shows that the kids are bundling up in warm clothes. They have their long shadows behind them. We're eating dinner inside. It's getting darker earlier. These are all things that are affecting the people in the winter time. Then I also included some of my favorite books about how people have responded to these short days throughout history and through a lot of different cultures. This book shares how the Scottish, the Romans, Indians of Peru, um, Native Americans, including the Cherokee that lived right here in Georgia, how they celebrated and responded to the winter solstice in these shorter days. And then this book is a longer chapter book, that, but one I like to read aloud that shares stories from India, Polynesia, China, um, Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, Venezuela, and Italy. Um, stories, folk tales of these shortest days and when we left the light and then now when we're returning to the light. So check out that one for some good read alouds for your kids. Maybe when you're having quiet time after hand washing or cleaning up. All right, let's talk about what's happening in the trees. One of the things that's happening in the trees is that the leaves are falling. They're on the ground so we can play with them. And one of the best ways to observe these leaves close up is to do a leaf rubbing. If you have your leaves, if you're able to, and if you have your computer paper, I'll show you here how to do this leaf rubbing. There you go, you should be able to see my paper. I have tons of leaves that I just collected from right outside my door. And here's a couple of the rubbings that I already did. So what you'll need is you'll need a leaf that is relatively flat, that won't crumble when you press on it. And the leaf goes underneath the paper. This is the hardest part for the kids to understand is this very first step. The leaf goes underneath the paper where you can't see it anymore. You can sort of feel it through there. And then you're going to take your crayon and very lightly go over the leaf and you'll see it pop through like magic. Now, one of the tricks is that you want to use your crayon in the same direction, back and forth like this, rather than like circles like this or in all directions or pressing too hard. You kind of have to get a feel for it. There's a magic touch. 
You can take the paper off your crayon and use the side of the paper, or you can just use the side of the tip. And if you lightly go over it, you can see the veins and the outline of the leaf even better than you could by looking at the leaf itself, I think. So that ends up looking like that. And you can bring your leaf back out. If you have your things and you make a leaf rubbing, show us in the camera here. We'd love to see. Looks like some of you guys are working hard on it. Oh, I can see Michelle's. That's great, it worked. And Jennifer's, oh, that's a big leaf, Jennifer. Awesome. Great. So we can use these, these leaf outlines to explore some characteristics of leaves. So you can see a chart here of lots of different characteristics of leaves or yes or no questions about leaves that we could ask kids. Depending on their age, you could get more and more specific about these different characteristics of these leaves. And you can sort all of these different leaves you find by these characteristics. Now you could go a step further and create what's called a dichotomous key to organize the leaves that you found. And this means sorting your leaves into, and we've done a lot of sorting in the past in some of these webinars, and a dichotomous sort is specifically asking a question that is yes or no, where all of your leaves can be sorted into either a yes to that question or no to that question. So you can see a student example here on the left. They collected a couple of different leaves, and then they asked questions like, is the leaf purple? If yes, you already got the right answer. This is the leaf you found. If not, here is your next question with a yes or no. This is a really fun activity for our older students. And then you can see on the right here what it looks like to use a real dichotomous key to identify leaves using these yes or no questions to get closer and closer to the exact tree that you are looking at. Another, I didn't take a picture of this one, but usually for a warm up of this lesson, we do this with our shoes. Everyone takes off one shoe and we create a dichotomous key with our shoes. Like, is it? Does it have laces? Yes or no? And all the lace shoes go over here and all the non-lace shoes go over there. And you can create a dichotomous key with your laces. All right, and then this meet a tree is just a fun activity where one kid is blindfolded and another kid leads them to a tree to feel around the tree on the ground and on the bark. And then they leave the tree and turn around a couple times and see if they can find it again, a sensory activity. And then real quickly, there's a couple of slides here on different ways that we can explore the animals that change in the winter. And I focused in specifically here on the birds. We love exploring the birds in our area. This is my favorite book, Everyday Birds, for um, identifying birds in a very simple way. You can see some pictures here of just a hawk and a cardinal with just one quick fact about each. This is a book about counting birds. We usually read this book and has a lot of facts about birds too and keep a tally of all the birds that we find. We also study bird sounds, especially for my first graders. They're studying high and low pitch and high and low volume. This is a book that identifies bird sounds by the vowel sounds. So this robin does tut, 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 where the um, dove here goes coo, coo. So that is all by the phonics, the vowel sounds. But you can also study bird sounds on if they get higher or lower pitch. So you can see here on the blackbird, the blackbird goes up, higher, lower to higher pitch, lower to higher pitch. Woo, 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 over and over and over again. But there's some that go lower, like this thrush, you can see in the sheet music, that goes lower, woo, 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 lower and over and over again. So when the kids are listening to some of these birds, they can find some of those ideas about higher and lower pitch that are in their standards and use some of those to identify which birds they find. All right, y'all, that was so many ideas for winter. I just really could not even lower down what I wanted to share with you guys. I was hanging out with Liz, who's in here um, a few weeks ago, and she was like, okay, Jenna, I need all your ideas for winter, because winter's hard, especially when it's a little bit chillier to be outside and the garden isn't growing as much, but there are so many different things that you can still do in the winter. And I hope that this webinar gave you a lot of those ideas and just a lot of inspiration that you can run with and ideas that are just starters for things that you can turn into lessons for your kids either at school or at home. So I'm interested in the chat box. I threw all these ideas at you. Um, I'm interested in hearing in the chat box, which of these ideas resonated with you? 
um, with whatever age group you're teaching, um, what are you excited to teach? Which of these things was like, oh yeah, my kids are gonna love that. I haven't done that before. That's gonna be fun. Share with us in the chat box and let us know what you're excited about doing. And then in a moment, you'll also see a poll pop up. My goal in this was just to give you lots of ideas that you could take with you so that you'd have something to do this winter with your kids. And so the poll is that same question, is how likely are you to teach outdoors with your kids? Even though it's a little chilly, even though the garden's not growing as fast, how likely are you to try some of these activities and get those kids outside in the fresh air, exploring the change in the seasons this winter. Oh, I love these ideas that are coming up in the chat box. Sometimes I feel like we should do just like an entire compost webinar. We could absolutely fill an hour, we'd probably fill a whole day with just um, the compost mini cakes and the compost systems and the vermiculture. Loving the compost ideas and the worms. Oh, Liz makes a good point that leaves are really easy with the virtual students. For those of you that are still virtual, as you saw with today's, um, going outside and finding leaves is a pretty easy ask for many of our um, students relatively. Uh, so they can gather those leaves and they can sort them at home on their desks to show virtually just like we did. Oh yeah, we, we really are digging the compost. Kimberly and Kimberly, I feel like we might need to uh, do some more compost webinars coming up. Oh, and Jennifer is into the shortest day activity in the sunrise sunset. I love that too. That's sort of new to my lesson repertoire over the last couple of years is getting closer to understanding that shortest day and celebrating that with the kids. Making a tunnel for the seeds and literacy integration. Oh, Jessica, I'm so glad you brought up literacy integration. We have an upcoming webinar on that we're about to tell you about. More compost, more compost. How to convince your principal that you want to do compost. Yeah, I think we need to do another compost webinar at some point. This is great. Oh, and I'm so happy to see all of um, these poll results too, that you guys are interested in sharing some of these outdoor ideas with the kids and not letting farm to school um, go to the side during these cold months. All right, let's see if Kimberly will share with us a little bit about what else we have to look forward to, except for the compost one that we haven't put on the schedule yet, but we should. Here's what we do have on the schedule coming up for you for upcoming webinars. Yeah, we definitely should. That would be a super fun one. So yeah, let's take a quick look at what's coming up so you can mark your calendars. On December 2nd, we're going to learn about how you can teach literacy through food in grades K through eight. This is actually one of my personal favorites that Jenna does. Literacy probably isn't the first subject you think of when thinking about subjects that can be taught through hands-on food and gardening activities. It might not seem like it lends itself as well as math or science, but it definitely does. And Jenna does a really fantastic job of demonstrating how, and it's a super fun workshop. So I really hope you join us on December 2nd for that. And then in the new year on January 13th, we'll do a workshop on planting an indoor garden with children, which is perfect for when it's too cold to work outside or perfect for if you just don't have much outdoor space to work in. Great, and one more thing I wanted to add after seeing the chat box here, I do wanna make sure that everyone knows that we are gonna send this presentation out. Um, and so, and for all the books that I um, mentioned throughout the presentation, I made sure to put a picture of the cover in it of it in the presentation. They're all available all over the internet um, to make sure that you can find those books. I have so many books to choose from and I have not quite yet made a book list, um, but at least the covers are in the presentation. You'll receive that and be able to find those books from there. All right, sorry for the interruption, Kimberly. <laughs> No worries. <clears throat> um, okay, so before y'all leave, um, know that we're going to send you a follow-up email. It will have a link to this presentation and a link to the recording of this presentation. And very important, a link to the evaluation survey of this presentation. So Kimberly Deladonna is actually gonna paste that survey link into the chat right now. Um, <clears throat> so that you can go ahead and get it out of the way if that's easiest. 
We use the feedback that you all provide in these evaluations of our presentations to make future workshops better, more relevant and more meaningful for you, more worth your time. And the info we collect also helps us continue to get grant funding so that we can keep doing these workshops. So please take a few minutes to complete that survey for us now or when we send it in that follow-up email. And um, thank you so much for joining us today and we hope to see you on December 2nd.